whether you're a manager, a director, or an engineer, you want to know as much as you can as efficiently as possible. Whether that efficiency is your raw materials, it may be that the world supply of a certain raw material is in the microgram scale, so you really can't afford uh, to waste anything. And it may be time, you may have just that one sliver of time, a shift overnight on your manufacturing line that's running 24 seven, and you only have those eight hours every month, and you better make it worthwhile. And then of course the other one is just straight up money. So that all of these things cost you know, resources across the board. So the more you can pack into that, the better. So again, the ability to learn about multiple variables, learn about those interactions between the nonlinear effects and all of that in a tight uh, experiment in a short amount of time with as few resources as possible uh, is really attractive to people on all ends of the, the cost spectrum. The ability to bring those two together in a very efficient experimental system where you get you, know, you, you get your absolute certainty on your main and, and two order effects and then also the ability to get quadratics in a real tightly uh, bound up experiment system was really a, a big a big development for Corning. The three things that really struck me that are key to why uh, industrial experimentation is so important are the uh, um, ability to see interactions. And in nearly every process, there are some amount of interactions that, that occur. So being able to tease those out is very important. Um, and also uh, the ability to, to deal with random effects uh, such as day-to-day, -day, um, time, temperature, things that could otherwise really block you from learning about your process by overwhelming uh, your one factor at a time experiments. And I think finally, even in the seemingly simple two factor Roman Haase experiment that he uh, brought up, it, it highlighted something that a lot of us encounter, which is uh, places where the experiment will just fail, either for product reasons or safety reasons. So you need to be able to uh, constrain your experiment. So definitely we've improved on efficiency. And, you know, to to, uh, to plug the product too, um, you know, Jump gives you uh, very good measures of, of how reliable your, you know, the coefficients of your model will be based on how reliable your, your or the uncertainty on your input data. So there's a there's you know lots of tools within Jump to help you uh, understand where what you can do with your data in, in a reliable way. To overcome these data accessibility issues, uh, like querying databases or multiple file import, joining data from mul multiple sources, tools like Jump have enabled us to do all that, but without having necessarily the need to program uh, to execute those those data processing. So I think more importantly than that is, is we've given those skills to engineers and the subject matter experts, uh, which are now doing it themselves and in, in turning that access uh, into active data, uh, doing faster and better proactive, uh, proactive analysis and, and improvement as a consequence. Yeah, I really think it's, uh, it's, it has benefited us to go away from Excel and, and towards more visual tools um, and thinking a lot more about how do I present uh, the message to the audience. Excel is a horrible tool for a lot of people. Uh, so that we were not thinking about the recipients either. So our message ended up not actually going across. So so we I don't think we got a lot out of it. Um, so we've kind of set the data more free, giving people easier tools to work with. And, and now we we see a much wider engagement uh, than when everything was going Excel sheets. So you can do things with advanced analytics or, or advanced statistics um, on large sets of data that you wouldn't normally be able to produce in a lab. That's the first thing I think is is quite important. The other example uh, we have is we're using a deep learning technique, a neural network network, network technique to predict when certain ovens will need maintenance. Um, and what we do is we make coke in an oven and that coke is 
in the oven for a very long time, it's about 48 hours. And after it's been processed, it's pushed out of the oven from one side to the other. And if the oven lining is not in a very good condition, then the plunger that pushes the, uh, the uh, coke out can stick to the walls. And then that means that all of the coke is lost. Uh, it means the oven has to be stripped out and uh, refitted. So it costs a lot of money, time and money. And that's not something that we were able to pinpoint before because there's no real way of saying when it's going to happen. You've got to, kind of, got to guess it happens like maybe once every two or three weeks. So you've got to keep an eye on it. But by using the machine learning uh, algorithms, you can see what the patterns are in the force of this plunger and see whether that can help you to predict when it's starting to stick and, and maybe be uh, proactive. So you can say, we're not going to use that oven, we're just going to refurbish that oven and use a different one at the same time. So that's something that we wouldn't have been able to do or was very, very sketchy. We've, we've reduced the amount of stickers, what we call the stickers, quite considerably, which saves quite a lot of money uh, and time in our process.